I welcome back, I welcome you back to the transformat transformative documentation, new approaches to community driven documentation initiatives. The third and final global workshop in our 2020 virtual series, Countering Erasure, Addressing Absent Spaces, Amplifying Voices at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. As many of you already know, my name is Silvia Fernandez and I am the Global Network Programs Director at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Before we get into um, the meeting, let me remind and go over a few important technical aspects. As you know, the meeting, um, actually you can go back, sorry, just to, to slide number one. <laughs> Um, the meeting is being translated into Arabic, English, French, and Spanish. To activate the translation feature in Zoom, please click the interpretation icon that you have at the bottom of your computers. Just a note, for, for some reasons today, when um, it says Chinese instead of Arabic, I apologize, we don't really know why, but it's actually Arabic, okay? So um, use that option, the Chinese option for Arabic. Um, again, to help our translators, uh, kudos to all of them. Good morning and good afternoon. Please try to speak a bit slower than you might uh, normally. Also, please remember to keep yourself muted when not speaking. If your connection is bad, please try turning off your video. If you have any technical problems during today's meeting, Ashley Nelson is with us today, no Camila, Ashley. Uh, she will be providing tech support so if you need to reach out to her, you can do so uh, using the private uh, chat. Ashley, or tech support, Ashley, I'm not sure. Um, you can do Ashley, um, okay. Ashley Nelson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll put it in the chat box. Great, Just thank this. you. And thank you, uh, Ashley, for being here with us. Again, she's based in New York, um, so it's, it's wee hours over there. So thank you, Ashley. In the chat box, Ashley has also um, posted the meeting's agendas in English, uh, Spanish, and French, and Arabic, so you can access it. And Elena uh, will now share the links to the three resource padlets that I mentioned yesterday. These are virtual flip charts to help us archive thoughts and resources throughout the meeting. We have been populating them um, over the past few days, but please use them as a public um, as a public resource for everyone. Okay, so as you go, if you have any reports or any resources or comments that you would like to make, uh, please feel free to go to any of these three padlets and and upload the information. Lastly, at the end of each uh, at the end of the session, we will have a poll and a, and a survey. I ask that you please take the time to respond. Um, this is really important for our work um, and um, to make any changes and any programming that, that we may need to do. So please take the time. Um, so Ashley, we can move into the next slide. So for those of uh, you who are joining us for the first time, let me make a brief introduction of the coalition. The coalition is the only global network of historic sites, museums, and memory initiatives that connect past struggles to today's movements of human rights and social justice. Funded in 1999, the coalition is now constituted by over 300 members in 65 countries, from Ellis Island in New York City to former centers of detainment in Argentina, to, the, to sites that remember and learn from the transatlantic slave trade in West Africa. We support our members in a variety of ways from technical support, networking, joint programs and training workshops like this one today. For more information, including how to join the coalition, please vi visit our website at sitesofconscience.org. Next, please, Ash. As explained yesterday, the theme of this year meeting and the reason why we are here today comes from the need of the Asia and the Pacific Network to counter or debunk official grand narratives in the region that do not represent the stories, experiences, or needs of communities at large. As a result, during last year meeting in Dharamsala, India, 
the Asian and Pacific Sites of Conscience Network agreed to allocate all efforts, resources, and activities to bring to the fore the voices of victims, women, youth, and ethnic and religious minorities in order to create alternative, more inclusive, and egalitarian national and regional historical narratives. Transformative documentation, the title and the topic of this week meetings, aims to be a stepping stone to achieve this mission. Through a combination of carefully selected presentations and panels, trainings and networking sessions, this week meeting wants to support, give visibility and strengthen community-led documentation initiatives that are actively contributing to social reconstruction, democracy building and the promotion of human rights. Yesterday's session served to set up the tone, familiarize with each other and get the conversation going. We are split in groups and we heard about different human rights violations and abuses taking place today and the challenges documenting them. We talk about failed attempts in dealing with the past and its ramifications today, like for example, the increasingly high rates of gender-based violence in countries like Colombia. And we discuss ways to strengthen global and regional alliances to build an even stronger culture of solidarity and support among coalition members. Today, we want to maximize the power of being part of a global network and learn from each other. In 30 minutes or so, we will have three coalition members from Germany, Syria, and Colombia present their work and share how they are using documentation for advocacy, accountability, and memorialization purposes. In the afternoon at 4 p.m. DACA time, our colleagues from the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth, and Reconciliation will conduct the first of two trainings on the role of community-led documentation in transitional justice processes. The training is open to all coalition members. And following this little introduction of mine, we want to share how at the regional level, the Asia Science of Conscience Network has agreed to leverage their documentation work to develop a small scale regional exhibit that offers alternative, more inclusive, and egalitarian national and regional historical narratives. On this note, I would like to introduce Radhika. Is Radhika with us? Hetiarachi, founder and curator of the Herb Stories Archive. Radhika, are you with us? Yeah, hi. Hi, great. So Radhika is an independent researcher, curator and peace building practitioner with over 15 years of experience working primarily in Sri Lanka. She uses oral history, facilitated dialogue and the arts as channels for creating a public discourse on conflict, conflict transitional justice and non-recurrence of violence. She has curated the Arts Festival Columboscope, the Hair Stories Project, mem a member of the coalition, the Memory Map Archive, and it's about Time Memory Museum, among other projects. Radhika is the curator of Our Shared Journeys, the Asia and Pacific Site of Conscience Regional Exhibit and Dialogues Project that she will present now. Hello, Radhika. Welcome. You gave me a little bit of a heart attack thinking that you were not joining, but I'm excited to have you here. It's all yours. Thank you. Sorry about that. My baby was having a meltdown, like literally screaming, and I just couldn't, I couldn't log on. Um, right. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for the introduction. Um, uh, I'll just briefly explain what the, what the, the, the start of this whole process was. Uh, as Sylvia said, we met uh, two years ago. Yes, two years ago in Dharamsala, and we were trying to figure Last out year. how as a was it last year? Last year, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I thought it was baby no, one is... and I was pregnant, so it must have been, you know. <laughs> My timing is completely messed up. Um, right, sorry about that. So last year, we uh, met up in Dharamsala and we agreed to kind of uh, try and find a way in which all of the Asian sites members would get together and produce something together because we always... We meet often, we work on different projects, but we share it with each other, but we hardly share it as a group uh, with the public. So one of the things we wanted to pursue was to try and figure out how we can position our work in the context of what the International Sites of Conscience uh, does as well, and position ourselves in our own countries with the goals of the uh, ISC, 
equity in mind and the goal of trying to work together and build our work together in some way in mind. So one of the things we came up with was to try and figure out a way in which to showcase our work through a small scale exhibition. And that process, um, thanks thanks to Sylvia and her hard work getting funding has come about now. So we are launching uh, our exhibition, our regional exhibition called Shared Journeys. And this whole exhibition is um, one of the ways in which we want to present all of our work against one theme, one overarching theme. And this overarching theme is um, countering brand narratives. So if we think about each of our countries uh, in this region, most of us have been through either uh, authoritarian regimes or war, we are post-conflict countries. Uh, and in some ways, we have outsider narratives and or alternative histories that are usually erased or at least marginalized uh, in the context also of um, a grand narrative, an official narrative, either it's a nation building narrative or a post-war narrative that is meant to showcase one single history. So what we wanted to do is to try and look at various projects that we each have and showcase that in a way to get the public to see that there are multiple narratives of histories that, and that single narratives are actually dangerous and we, we as a civil society should be countering those narratives. So that is the goal of the Shared Journeys exhibition, our shared projects and our shared efforts to counter master narratives. So the purpose of this, other than to position our work and to share it in this context, is to actually get communities that we work with and the general public to engage in a discussion, to decolonize the mind, if you will, uh, to try and provide both space to question these top down own exclusive narratives, but also begin to think about how we can ourselves share our own narratives and our own truths in within that milieu of a grand narrative. So what it will be is basically we're hoping that it will be 10 countries showcasing any amount of uh, work that each of these organizations have been doing but something that fits into this theme of contesting narratives. So it could be a completely different project. For example, in Sri Lanka, the Her Stories project that I uh, founded and represent is about feminizing versions of history that is essentially masculine. So it is about contesting a narrative of war that is masculine. Um, similarly, uh, the work that Muthu does from Sri Lanka is about adding a new narrative of um, the state community uh, workers and their histories to this narrative of Sri Lankan history because they are often excluded from that narrative. So there are other projects similarly in and around our region that contest grand narratives in a very particular and specific way in their countries. So what it will be hopefully is that at least 10 countries in this Asia Pacific region will participate in producing showcasing their own work under the banner of shared journeys. So this will be essentially a regional panel exhibition. But what we are hoping to do is because each country context is different and because the advocacy goals in each country is different, we are hoping that the material would be the same, but we will be able to tweak it in a way to support the work of the local sites of conscience members and their sort of uh, overarching goals for this exhibition. We're hoping that the exhibition will also include a dialogue component, something that reaches out, especially to children. So there will be an educational component attached to it, maybe questions or um, panel discussions or focus group discussions in each country, depending on what the, the partner within the country would like to do as well, that actually engages this material and makes you think beyond what is just there in your own country to try and try and see and pull lessons from other countries as well in order to create this broad base of a multiple narrative uh, against uh, what is known as the single narrative. Um, that essentially is the exhibition that we, or the uh, basic overview of uh, the Shared Journeys exhibition. Um, I'm aware of the time as well. And if you have any questions we can share or Sylvia, if there's anything you want to add, or any of the Asian sites conscience members, if there's anything you want to add, uh, we can we can do that now. 
Thanks, Radhika. Maybe mention a little bit, um, the project is supposed to be a one year, right? It's gonna be a one year project. A little bit about the timeline um, to, to manage expectations of when the exhibit may go live. So maybe a little bit about the timeline. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, the process of the curatorial process is going to take some time because what, we are, what we're trying to do is to understand each of these contexts, what's available material from up to 20 uh, members from 10 countries. So there is, it is going to take some time. So we are currently in the first phase, which is the research phase where we're trying to find out what we have and what materials, what gaps are and how to fill these gaps and develop a sort of a narrative arc for the exhibition. Um, so phase one probably would be till the end of January. And then from then on, I think we will have uh, a period where we're developing the exhibition, producing the material that needs to go into this exhibition uh, alongside developing the outreach and the educational component. Uh, all of that we assume, which is a phase two and three would probably take till about August. And we are hoping that this exhibition will go live in August. August, September um, uh, is the, the time period for this. But of course, it doesn't prevent the organizations within the country of taking the exhibition and making it a traveling exhibition after. But the 10 countries simultaneous exhibition that we hope to have is probably gonna be August, September. Thanks. And then just um, to add to that, we will also be developing in collaboration with obviously all the participating members, um, dialogue or community engagement activities that support and help contextualize uh, the exhibit and obviously helps um, engage uh, the audience in, in what the, the, the issues that the exhibit is, is raising. Any questions, anyone? or comments or show emotional actions of how exciting this is. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually quite exciting because you know, if you think about it, I mean, a lot of the work we do, we, we don't really share as a group and we don't leverage it for uh, local advocacy needs. So I think it is quite an exciting project in a way that we're able to um, bring all of these different projects that may not seem relevant to you, but within this banner, it becomes completely relevant. And as Sylvia and I mentioned earlier as well, the outreach component would be around that advocacy goal. So it's actually, I think it's quite an exciting way to build on the work we're doing within each of our countries as well. And for those of you who participated yesterday and were here when um, our keynote speaker, Rita, was um, mentioning uh, Nigerian author, Chimamanda Adichie, called, mm. you know, she talking about the single stories, right? How the single story creates uh, stereotypes, right? And the problem with these stereotypes is not that uh, they, are untrue, not only that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete, right? And they, they help become, make this only a story or single story. So the goal of this exhibit is to actually um, counter those single stories and provide a more diverse alternative um, stories. Hi, um, Radhika and Sylvia, I'm Nadine from ICES. I just- Hi Nadine. Hi, <laughs> this sounds exciting. And I, I, I just missed the last meeting, uh, the meeting you had on uh, the discussion on shared journeys last week. So maybe my question, I mean, might have already been answered then, but I'm just wondering uh, whether you have already started collecting material for the exhibition or is this, I mean, um, and have you already decided uh, which countries are participating in the exhibition and what the process is to kind of maybe propose certain exhibits for this uh, uh, exhibition? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I think some of that was discussed in the last meeting with the, with the the, uh, the group that were participating, but I'm happy to share a little bit more. And, and also we'll be having another meeting on the 11th uh, at which actually we'll be going 
going into more detail about the process and so on. So uh, it's uh, it'll be good if all the members are part of that meeting. Uh, but just briefly to explain, uh, we haven't been we haven't done any uh, material collection. As I was saying, it's a long term process. Process. Um, so what the next phases in terms of material collection is to find out what material would fit from each of these organizations. Uh, it is open to, uh, there are 20 members in the Asia Pacific region and it's open to everyone. It doesn't necessarily mean that all 20 will want to participate by providing material, but all 20, if they want to, can participate in other ways. There are supporting roles, obviously, other than the content itself, there are supporting roles in terms of organization and managing volunteers or um, managing the outreach program, the community engagement components. So there's, there's ways in which all of the partners can be a part of it. But we first need to find out what everybody has and how they would like to be a part of this uh, exhibition. So there is a questionnaire uh, uh, and uh, that's going out uh, soon, which you have to fill out by the end of, the, by the end of this month. Uh, with the kind of material that would suit, what you think would uh, support this, what gaps you see in your own material, what advocacy goals you have, and so on. For, for me to be able to understand what's out there in order to create the narrative arc for this exhibition. So in terms of the next steps, uh, what we are hoping would happen is that there would be country level focus, po uh, focus points um, in each of these 10 countries. Uh, who uh, will work with the other organizations if there are more than one organization in each country uh, that are part of the ICSC, uh, that the focal point will work with them to uh, kind of uh, share, showcase and share the material that each organization has that fits the theme. Um, so the next step mainly is to appoint these focal points, which we will talk about on the 11th. Uh, and then uh, answer the questionnaires about what content you have, but at the same time, we'll be sharing a questionnaire on the context of each country, because as I said, we, even though the exhibition is essentially the same in terms of material, we will tweak the material in certain ways uh, in, to support one, the work that the organizations in country do, and two, to manage uh, any socio-political security risks that each of these countries might ha have. So. To, uh, to do all of that, we need to understand the context from your point of view. So we'll be sending out a questionnaire um, about the context as well. So the next steps after that will be tabulating all of this information and trying and engaging with each of these local partners separately to understand the material better and to develop this narrative arc. So the short answer, to, that was a very long answer, but the short answer to your question is we haven't begun to collect the material. It will start in earnest after the 11th. Correct. So Nadine and any other member of the Asian and the Pacific Sites of Conscience Network who couldn't join us last week when we had our initial sort of introduction uh, call, please make sure that, uh, to join us on December 11th. Uh, December 11th, yes. Um, that's when we will be holding a closed door internal um, session and we will be discussing all the mechanics and next steps on uh, building and working together on the Shared Journeys exhibit. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you Radhika for the presentation. Um, now we will move into um, the next session is our first panel. And I would like to introduce Nana Jo Endo, the moderator of the panel documenting human rights violations worldwide a human rights activist, a storyteller, and gender equality specialist. Nana Jo is the founder and executive director of the African Network Against Extrajudicial Killings and Enforced Disappearance, known as ANECET in the Gambia, a civil society organization that combines the power of technology, storytelling, traditional media, and legal expertise to make issues related to enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings much more visible, advocating for justice for victims and their families. Nana Jo is also one of the initiators of the Jamed to Justice campaign, which seeks to bring Jaja Jamed, the former Gambian director, uh, director, dictator, excuse me, and his accomplices to justice. 
She has worked for various NGOs and international organizations in different countries like Europe, South America, West Africa, and North America over the past 10 years, and speaks English, French, Spanish, as well as Portuguese fluently. Passionate about justice, women's empowerment, and the expression of the sociopolitical identity of Black people around the world, Nana Jo is encouraged by those who have the courage to speak their truth. Nana Jo, it's great to have you here with us moderating the panel. I let you take the lead now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, for this. Uh, oh, sorry, Sylvia, sorry, for this uh, um, introduction. Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here. I will be your moderator for the next session, which is called Documenting Human Rights Violations Worldwide. Um, the session will provide an overview of the role of documentation in protecting human rights through the experiences and work of three sites of conscience. Um, and I have to admit, for someone working on documenting human rights violations, I'm very excited to hear what our stellar panelists have to say. I'm sure this will be very informative for us all today. Um, so I just wanted to briefly give you again, you know, a few reminders just to make sure that you turn off your microphones during the discussion. And at the end of the presentations, there will be three presentations. There will be a 10 minute Q and A session. So you'll have time to ask any questions that uh, you have. And again, as you're aware, we have uh, simultaneous translation in Spanish, Arabic, French, and English. So please choose your preferred language. Um, Sylvia, I just wanted to know as well quickly if the uh, virtual flip charts, um, how they work had already been explained? Yep, they've been explained. Perfect. Perfect. So I don't have to do it. Um, <laughs> please feel free to do it, <laughs> to use them. I tried and I think it's quite uh, user friendly and straightforward. So um, I want to start by saying that before I got into this line of work, if, you had, if I had been asked what human rights violations documentation was and entailed, I would have naively responded that it is just recording accurately human rights violations. Full stop. That's how simple I would have responded. Um, and then I've come to understand that it's much more. It can be a, a powerful tool in knowledge production, societal contestation, education on human rights abuses and the importance of fighting impunity, including different voices, furthering um, specific transitional justice mechanisms, such as the use of archives for the evidentiary foundation in criminal trials. Um, it could be a powerful tool for uh, in advocating for victims and a complementary way of dealing with the past in addition to other transitional justice mechanisms and preserving memory. Um, on that last one, I just want to share a brief anecdote with you. Um, the uh, Jerry John Rawlings, the former president of Ghana recently died um, and he had ruled uh, for 20 years after coming into power in 1981 um, through a coup. He came, through, uh, he came in power through a coup. So um, his death and legacy seems to have polarized Ghana. And while he modeled himself as opposed to corruption and many accredit him as the voice of the people, under his military rule, heads of state, um, other high ranking officials were executed, market women were blamed for an economic crisis, some publicly flogged, there were extrajudicial killings, including of judges, People were jailed over corruption allegations, detained incommunicado, disappeared or tortured. Um, yet, seven days of national mourning was ordered in Ghana when his death was announced. Um, and a friend of mine messaged me saying, I'm so shocked by the amnesia. He was not a hero in my house at all. And as a matter of fact, in many families who were torn apart. So that's the huge question that is sort of starting a debate a bit is how did we get here? I mean, Ghana did have a National Reconciliation Commission and it looked at the human rights abuses under the Rawlings regime. So I think this is a question that highlights the complexity of documentation, how it's used or how it's done, 
how it's used and how you know it's also available um moving on i think you know we have these we have three different um panelists they come from very different backgrounds um and diff different regions on the world um who will actually um uh, highlight these complexities so i'd like to first introduce our first speaker which is uh her name is Sophia Botrian, Botrian Kaiser. Sophia, I hope I said your name correctly and I haven't butchered it. And uh, she represents the Memoriam Nuremberg Trials where she works as a research associate. Her focus is on education, facilitation and inclusion. And she has a background in political science and sociology and human rights and humanitarian law. So before working at the Memoriam Nuremberg Trials, she worked at the Human Rights Office of the City of Nuremberg. Um, Sophia, over to you now. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Actually, my last name is pronounced Broste and Kaiser, but this is really, really hard to do. So uh, just call me Sophie and I will be very fine with that. Um, yeah, hello everybody and good morning from Germany or good afternoon to wherever you are right now. Um, I had prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, can you see them? Ah, it's already there. Okay, great. So yeah, good morning. The Memoriam Nuremberg Trials is an information and documentation center. Courtroom 600, um, that is the room in which the trials were held, is at the heart of our exhibition. In the exhibition, we inform about the Nuremberg Trials, the subsequent trials and international criminal law today. Um, before I go more into detail here and before I start telling you about it, um, I would first like to thank Sylvia and Elena and all those people I don't know personally for organizing this event and for doing that. Thank you very much and also for inviting me today. <laughs> yeah. Um, in these 15 minutes that I have today, I would like to focus on the historic event of the Nuremberg Trials, and I will speak a little bit about the development of international criminal law today. I know this is uh, quite ambitious, um, and therefore I will just start right into it. Oh yeah, next slide is already there, thank you. We begin our story in 1945. On um, the 7th of May, the German Wehrmacht, the German military, surrendered officially and one day later was the end of World War II in Europe. It took, however, a little bit longer for other parts of the world. Uh, Japan surrendered on 2nd September in 1945. The war ended with approximately 60 million dead people unspeakable crimes were committed during the war, Hitler Germany brought unimaginable pain and horror to the world. I don't have to go into any details here, you all know that. The question is, um, where do we go from here? How do you deal with uh, Germany, a country that has yet started another world war? Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, long story short, uh, one answer to this question is um, the so-called Nuremberg trials. The first and most famous one is the Nuremberg Major War Criminals Trial, which was opened on November 20th, 1945 and lasted almost a year until October 1946. The four allied powers, the USA, Soviet Union, France and the UK cooperated and worked together in order to create this international military tribunal. So international military tribunal is sometimes I say IMT and I mean this major war criminals trial. However, that was not the only one. Um, the IMT was followed by 12 subsequent trials from 1945 to um, 1949. And all of these trials were held in courtroom 600 and the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. It was for the first time in history that high ranking representatives of a state had to answer, had to answer for their crimes in a court. So something like this has never happened before in world. Next slide, please. Uh, I think you skipped one, but it doesn't matter. Um, okay. No, can, can you go back, please? And no, back the other way. And one back. Okay. 
there was another one. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, sorry for the confusion. Um, what do you need in order to have a successful and fair trial? I mean, um, which roles and persons do you need? Um, and one of those uh, that you need are obviously judges. Um, what you can see here is a picture of the judges. As I mentioned before, the IMT was only possible because there was a cooperation between those four allied powers. They all worked together in order to realize it. And so all of them provided at least one judge. They sit in front of their flags and they also provided another deputy judge just in case something would have happened. So those eight men you see behind there on the background, those are the judges. Next slide, please. And here is a picture of the president. Um, his name was Sir Geoffrey Lawrence. Um, he's seated at the center. Next slide, please. So uh, when you have a court um, and a trial, of course, you need defendants um, and defend the defendants. There are those famous Nazis. All of them were representatives of a state. Um, when you look at the picture, you see at the very background um, those guards with the white helmets. They are their standing guard. In front of them, on those two lines, that's the defendant sitting here in the dock. Some of them really took it as an insult that they were tried as ordinary men before a court. In front of um, the defendants, you have uh, the defense lawyers. I'll come to them later. There's always some confusion with the numbers. Um, there was a list of 24 defendants, though at the end it was only 21 persons meeting, uh, being in court. So what happened to those three? One of them um, was dismissed due to incompetence to stand trial. Another one, Martin Bormann, um, the trial against him was held in absentia. He was already dead at the moment, but the Allied powers did not know that. So they still hoped that they would catch him. And the third one committed suicide before trial. So this is the thing with those three people. Then there are three people who were not um, on the dock at all. That was Hitler, Himmler and Goebbels. All of them had committed suicide at the end of the war. Next slide, please. So, it was not only people as alleged perpetrators before the IMT, but also organizations. Indictment were also entered against these organizations that are listed here. Next slide, please. When we talk about indictments, um, of course, you need to have indictments for this court. Um, the following indictments were agreed up on in the London Charter. The London Charter is a document uh, which was basically the basis for the IMT. All of the Allied powers had signed it and some other states too. We had four indictments um, at the Nuremberg trials. The first one, common plan or conspiracy. The second one, crimes against peace. The third one, war crimes. And the fourth one, crimes against humanity. Some of these indictments might sound familiar to you. War crimes, for example, is indeed an, or was already established um, as a charge even before the Nuremberg trials. Crimes against humanity, however, which is quite common today in international criminal law, um, was used here for the first time in Nuremberg. Next slide, please. We already talked about them. Um, essentially, for a fair trial, is um, to have defense lawyers. Here you can see one of them preparing for court. Um, and I think it was is very important to point out here that um, the Allied powers really took it seriously to have a fair trial. So each defendant was entitled to a defense lawyer to help them and to represent them in court. Next slide, please. All in all, there were four prosecution teams. Again, one prosecution team for each allied power um, and each dealing with one of the indictments. So their job was it to lay out what each of the defendant was accused of. We had individual indictments for each defendant. And on this picture here, you can see Robert H. Jackson. He was chief American prosecutor, and that is when he was opening the trial. So he's a very important person. We come back to him later. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, the interpreters, we already talked about them today a little bit. Um, they are so important. Without interpreters, um, the IMT would not have been possible. As we can see today on this online conference, today it is very, very common to have simultaneous interpretation in several languages at once for large international meetings. Um, the reasons for that are obvious. Everybody has the same information at once and there's no delay in time that you have um, as you would have with consecutive interpretation. The birthplace of simultaneous interpretation was indeed the Nuremberg trials. So um, that was for the first time that proceedings were translated simultaneously into different languages. Um, they used the language German, English, Russian and France. And on this picture here, you can see um, there's men and women working there. We had always teams of three people and shifts up to four or five hours. So that was really, really hard job. <laughs> By the way, thanks to the tr translators <laughs> at this point. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is the part which I guess is uh, most important for this topic in this panel and for the conference here, the evidence. You cannot have a trial and accuse people of crimes without presenting any evidence to that and therefore you need the documentation. The crimes of the Nazis were numerous and unspeakable. However, in a court, um, you have to be very precise. You have to uh, name dates, you have to name places, you have to name the names of those people who committed or allegedly committed the crimes. You need to show evidence how certain incidents might have happened. Um, and so a lot of knowledge that we have today about the crimes of the Nazis is because of the work of the Nuremberg trials. Another first time, it was also for the first time that film as evidence were authorized in court. Um, all in all, they showed three films. Uh, one of them is the quite famous liberation of the Nazi camps. Furthermore, more than 4,000 documents as evidence made their way into court. We speak about things as written orders, um, things as a chain of command or personal letters. They also were used. And all these more than 4,000 documents were translated in the four languages. So now you can guess how much work they put into that. Um, in addition to this, there were more than 1,000 affidavit. Um, an affidavit is a written explanation, um, so you did not have all those uh, witnesses in court. You did not have a thousand people extra there. Nevertheless, we had all in all 139 witnesses in court giving their testimony and um, they were nominated by both sides. So the prosecution and the defense could nominate witnesses. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Just to close the story, after almost a year, the judges came to the following verdict. We had 12 death penalties, three lifelong sentences, four long prison sentences and three acquittals. Next slide, please. This quote is by Chief Prosecutor Robert H. Jackson. We have talked about him before and it shows the aims and the moral aspirations of the IMT that four great nations flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law, is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. Next slide, please. And next one, we skip that. Thank you. Um, yeah, the subsequent trials. Um, I'll be quick. The story wasn't over with the verdicts from the IMT. Um, it was certainly not enough to sentence just 21 persons. Um, the 12 subsequent trials were all held in the same courtroom 600, but it was an international corporation. It was not international corporation anymore. It was just um, a US military court. Those 12 trials were held between 1946 and 1949 in Nuremberg and all in all 177 high ranking people were um, tried there. The trials revealed the extent to which the German leadership class supported the power and system of the Nazi dictatorship. Next slide please. And the next one. Yeah. So. 
Um, of course, there is much more to say about German history and how the legal prosecution of the Nazis went on and how much was not done. Um, but this is not a topic today. So as promised, I will now skip a lot of developments. And now we jump um, in the year in the 1990s um, to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So when we look at the development of international criminal law, um, First, we had the IMT in Nuremberg, um, again, for the first time that um, high ranking people of a state were taken to trial and then for a long time, nothing happened. So the next step was the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, um, which lasted until, nine, uh, until 2017. Next slide, please. I'm almost done. <laughs> Almost parallel to the ICTY was the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So these two um, trials, uh, tribunals were created by the Security Council of the United Nations. Next slide, please. And this is the last one too, so I'm almost done with my 15 minutes. In 2002, the ICC the International Criminal Court came into force. Um, and as with any other court, it only can act if there's documentation of crimes, of abuses or of human rights violations. The fact that we have the ICC today is a great success. Um, you can say a lot about the ICC and how successful or not successful it work is. Um, and it's certainly not perfect. Um, there is much to improve. Nevertheless, um, just the fact that it exists and um, that at least some people are held accountable for the crimes is a success today. However, and I would like to close with this, um, legal prosecution of crimes is just one aspect out of many, other, many others when it comes to why documentation of human rights violation is so important today. And I'm, will sure, I'm sure we will hear much more about these other aspects from the other panelists and during this meeting. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, this was very interesting and um, I actually do have a few questions for the end. Um, so, but in the meantime, what we're going to do is move on to the next presentation and uh, the next person that will be speaking is Fadel Abdulgani and he is the founder and head of the Syrian Network for Human Rights. Um, the, um, network, the Syrian Network for Human Rights was founded in June 2011. I hope that's correct. And it's been going on to date. Um, over the past 10 years, Fadel has advocated for human rights through managing the Syrian Network for Human Rights. So it's also um, known as its acronym SNHR. Um, and by doing so via hundreds of investigations on human rights violations, as well as participating in the writing of hundreds of reports um, and investigations and researches. Um, Fidel comes with a breadth of experience, including speaking at many international events, including the UN Security Council and Human Rights Council. He also worked as an independent consultant in human rights file to provide counsel to the Syrian opposition's convoy during several peace negotiations meetings in Geneva. He has also trained tens of the tens of the leaders of the political offices of the armed opposition on the rule on international customary law and has written many opinion articles, um, reports or participated in um, putting together reports and researches with local, regional and international organizations other than his work uh, with the organization he's heading. Um, so Fadel, on this note, I will let you take uh, the floor. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, uh, the uh, organization of uh, this essential event and uh, for having me. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, our experience in Syria uh, for now past uh, almost 10 years. 
and how the our organization documenting the violation in this extraordinary situation in Syria and how it's developed and how the methodology being changed due to some examples. Um, and um, I think like maybe based on this event or based on this essay, which I written and I hope this will publish soon, like we can move ahead and talk about specific um, and handle about specific uh, topic like um, Caesar files or uh, chemical weapons uh, or uh, barrel bombs or torture. But like um, I would like to start and uh, give, uh, give a wide range of um, the uh, documentation uh, in Syria and how it uh, and how it's difficult and uh, and uh, yeah, I'll, I, uh, is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, so I think that uh, the essay is talking a bit in general, giving an example of um, extrajudicial killing, uh, which is uh, almost match the, uh, the, the the process of the extrajudicial killing documentation is almost match uh, other types of violation. SNHR is um, documenting wide range of violation, um, including um, arbitrary uh, detention, uh, disappearance, um, torture. Uh, destruction, um, uh, random shilling and displacement and uh, other types of violation. Uh, and we are keen to uh, uh, include the women and children. And we have like um, in, in all of our uh, report and statistic. And uh, we, we have a like type of uh, partnership with, uh, with UNICEF in this regard. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start in, in my essay and I hope uh, it can be circulated to uh, uh, our uh, coalition member. Uh, so uh, um, civilian casualties ha ha have fallen since the early days of the popular uprising uh, in March 2011. Um, security services um, responded to a, a peaceful demonstration with a direct live gunfire and uh, killed and uh, wounding a lot of um, Syrian citizens. Uh, I'll, I'll talk in uh, uh, five main um, aspects. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about the initial stages, then I'll talk the, about the how we relied on the electronic programs and how was um, the then due to the entry of multiple parties uh, to the conflict um, um, the development of SNHR methodology. Then the fourth point is um, the most notable challenges uh, uh, and um, uh, the fifth one is about uh, the evidence presented by SNHR, uh, and this is type of uh, the advocacy. So the initial um, uh, stage, uh, um, it, it, and and you are you, you was right. Um, uh, the organization is established in June, uh, 2011. Uh, uh, it's uh, a bit delay, but uh, because uh, the idea was not in, in, in my mind until uh, like I tried several uh, times to contact with the previous uh, activists in Syria or local um, organization, but I didn't notice that there is a periodic report or, fol or following up or accumulative work. Accumulative work meaning to build um, a center database and to work cumulatively and to follow up all of those. So um, SNHR is process a huge database of, of those violations and categorize this database. Uh, so SNHR established in, in June 2011. And um, um, at this stage, uh, my object is setting up the SNHR 
to accurately document the killing, to circulate this information to various media outlets and some international bodies uh, um, in, in an effort to communicate a verified uh, 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 data documented with um, the greatest accuracy and uh, professionalism. So that will enable the international community, uh, in particular, the civilized um, um, uh, countries to and the United Nations to build up on, on this and to protect the, the civilians, stop the killing and, and, uh, and the violation which is uh, reached to uh, crimes against humanity as, uh, um, as the United Nations mentioned in all of the Commission of Inquiry report, especially the, the, the first report. So the progress of building the team, which is initially uh, uh, consisted mostly on volunteers at, at, the, at the initial uh, stage, uh, uh, was based on a direct relationship and communication. And from a very uh, first day, I tried to take into account the uh, geographic, uh, geographical uh, distribution process, um, especially uh, focused on the hot uh, provinces or hot location, where is the a demonstration taking place. Why is that? Because the main violation at that uh, period was committed against those protesters or riding um, 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 their houses or, or follow up the, them uh, where they hiding and uh, kill them or uh, arrest them and then uh, committed torture or this uh, or they being uh, uh, this this appeal. So uh, um, I, I'll, I'll not like speaking a lot about this. Uh, uh, so I hope that uh, uh, due to the time, the 15 minute, I think it's not enough because it's uh, about 14 pages. Uh, so uh, like after the, the uh, um, so we collecting data from our uh, team members, the volunteers, which is uh, each of those are linked to uh, uh, and, and, and build um, a relationship with um, uh, the uh, eyewitnesses, with the families, and um, the, actually the, the relation uh, built based on uh, the violation, I mean the violation areas when um, a violation uh, uh, taking place in some areas. So we uh, run after this violation and based on that, we build um, uh, contact. Uh, then we have the verification process, uh, um, and um, which is uh, 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 built based on the organization hierarchy. So there is a field researcher, then there is like above of this field researcher, there is the head of um, each department, uh, the casualties department, and then the, we have the detainees department, uh, and we have uh, uh, also uh, uh, the, the report department and, and uh, uh, the woman and the children department, uh, which is enable us actually to continue and to, um, I can say, gain the trust of the community is um, SNHR is keep publishing uh, a, a daily casualties report and publishing then developed to publish a monthly report, then published a, a thematic report. And being covered well by the Arabic and the local media, so the community is heard about us and start also at this. So we moved now from the first stage, which we are following the news and now we are getting news, we receiving. So we became a, a well-known, a bit well-known, better than when we established. And that's, and that's actually cumulatively uh, uh, increased due to uh, continuous work and due to also our daily paces, uh, our daily basis uh, follow, follow, following up. And uh, quoting SNHR by the, the UN, um, the, uh, mainly the High Commissioner 
and uh, by other um, international human rights organization also um, giving us a high level of um, credibility in front of our community, uh, uh, which is, uh, was our, our main concern at, at this stages. Uh, uh, mo moving ahead, actually, uh, uh, there is a list of, um, of uh, how we um, documented and a, a list of how we verified uh, the news in, in our methodology and uh, the photos, uh, all of that. The, the, key, the key point in, in this uh, uh, regard is the expandination of, um, of relationship with the, um, the victims and the survivals. Um, um, and as, as possible as we can, we need to uh, have this variety uh, because we want to get um, information mainly from two different uh, sources, which is sometimes is difficult. Sometimes we are getting even uh, uh, about one incident, mainly if it's a, a big incident. So there is a lot of testimony uh, massacres taking place or, or riding for the neighborhoods. So we used to take uh, uh, more than two, sometimes it's re it reached uh, uh, 11, 12 testimony, and we try to match those to see where is the discrepancy, to see where is the contradiction and, and all of those. And which, which is like recorded in the database uh, actually is the one which we believe, we, we believe or thought that this is um, uh, somehow accurate. So we, uh, based on the methodology, we record this in, in database. Actually, SNHR build from, from um, zero and expand. Um, so we used to, um, to work manually and build um, a, a daily word uh, files uh, of the list of casualties written manually, actually, and named by the day of the name. But by expandination of the violation, which is the an uprising in Syria moved from territory uh, province to, to other province and, and, and cities. Um, based on this expandination of the uh, uprising, the violation also expanded. So the manual work uh, was, uh, became actually uh, very difficult. So we move ahead toward um, um, the technical program and we build a complex technical program which has enabled us to, um, uh, to store all of uh, those word files automatically in the program. The program um, read um, um, uh, the, uh, uh, those program built on MySQL uh, language and we no need any um, more to enter the data in uh, or the, the, the files in, in the data. Uh, the program is um, reading those uh, files and automatically store it uh, and distribute it based on the province, gender, types of, of violation. And the program also enable us to extract uh, those, um, uh, whatever we, we want based on on which day or, uh, uh, or, or area or um, which type of violations. Um, the program also enable us to, to do that. Um, but like manual work is, uh, um, uh, that doesn't mean that the manual work is um, uh, uh, not required anymore. Um, of course, we need to build those files uh, manually and to uh, to written uh, um, 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 each cases in um, uh, uh, a language program way. Uh, uh, one, one message. Okay, five minutes. Five minutes is very uh, okay. I, I'll jump. Uh, uh, so. The, 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 the main difficulties actually uh, is um, that several parties engage in 
Um, and this is one example of the difficulties and the challenge, challenging in, uh, in the Syria conflict. Um, uh, at the beginning, there was only uh, Assad regime, the Syrian regime, and uh, the regime itself hired tremendous amount of local militias and then hired also and bring the Iranian militias as well, uh, Hezbollah. So all of those categorized as, as um, um, uh, Syrian regime forces. Then, uh, uh, then we have the uh, opposition uh, forces, uh, which is uh, established in um, uh, by end of 2011, then the extremist group um, entered the conflict, Al-Nusra Front, but at the early stage of uh, 2012. Um, ISIS actually, after more than uh, two years uh, established in, in Syria, uh, after the more than two years from the beginning, then we have the uh, PYD, uh, the Democratic uh, Union Party, uh, which is the branch of the uh, uh, Kurdistan uh, Worker Parties, PKK. Uh, we have also then in September uh, 2014, the uh, coalition uh, led by the US, uh, um, coalition ag against ISIS. Then in September 2015, we have the Russian forces. Then um, in uh, also we have uh, the uh, uh, Turkish um, forces uh, in 2016. Uh, all of those parties actually uh, uh, make the documentation is further uh, complicated. SNHR is trying always to assign uh, uh, the um, um, uh, to, to attribute the incident to to those who's responsible about it. So that sometimes make it difficult for us, especially when, um, for example, at the same time, the Russian forces and the regime waging um, 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 like uh, the, the air forces uh, of, of both of them waging an attack against um, a neighborhood. So, so, so each one of those committed this. Um, sometimes uh, it's, um, it's difficult actually. Uh, I'll, I'll move to the final uh, stage, then I'll uh, maybe be due to the time. I leave some uh, sort of, uh, they say for um, uh, the question, but like I want to refer to that due to the uh, long uh, uh, time of the uh, uh, conflict now it's almost uh, 10 years without any types of accountability of, of the high scale of uh, violation which is reached to crimes against humanity and war crimes as well uh, uh, that that lead to the um, deep uh, frustration in between the um, Syrian community. So they are like f faithless about the uh, documentation process. Um, without cooperation from the primary source, source which is the, the families themselves, the documentation will be so difficult actually. Um, so I think we need to re rethink about how, how we uh, like uh, build a faith of the documentation process. Uh, we always talking about archiving the, the history of the Syria and not changing the narrative as the dictatorship want to, uh, to do that. The final, uh, the final one, uh, which has, I want to, to highlight is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, which is the ad advocating point, uh, SNHR actually is one of the main source of um, the United Nations, um, uh, especially in their analysis uh, in casualties in, um, in Syria. 
um, uh, uh, also engaged uh, in, in almost all of the Commission of Inquiry reports. Uh, um, um, we have an agreement with the OBCW in their investig investigation about chemical weapons. We have a partnership with UNICEF providing data uh, uh, from our documented cases uh, on the violations against the children. Uh, we have also uh, other partnership with um, uh, an international um, organization, not um, only with um, with the UN. Um, so um, that enable uh, the uh, enable us to reflect our database on the report, not reports uh, published by us. We have uh, we have three monthly report one about casualties, one about um, casualties in the previous months, one, one about the detention and the, 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 the disappearance, and one, the third one is talking about the general um, and, and the all different types of violation and the, the general conditions of the human rights violation in the previous months. But also we have, um, uh, in, after those three monthly reports, we have a thematic report in, in, the, in, in, in each month highlighting uh, different um, um, suffering of, of, of our community, trying to reach out to the decision makers uh, and um, via those uh, documented um, uh, reports. Um, I hope that um, this a very quick um, uh, introduction about our work is um, um, sufficient and um, I'm open uh, for um, any question. Thank you very much again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Fadel. There's certainly a lot um, of information that you shared with us. Um, may I also ask if you could share your email address in case um, others want to contact you directly? And actually, Sophia, I forgot to ask you to do um, the same. If you could just put it in the uh, chat box, it would be great so that if anybody has any questions or would like to learn more about your work, they can follow up as well um, privately. So um, we were supposed to have uh, Jose, um, Jose Antequera from the Centro de Memoria, Paz y Reconciliación um, from Colombia, but unfortunately he is not available. But we are very lucky to have Dario Colmenares um, present with us today and he is going to step in. He's the program director at the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth and Reconciliation, the coalition's flagship program on transitional justice. Dario played a central role in the Center for Memory, Peace and Reconciliation in Bogota since its creation in 2008, where he coordinated uh, participatory truth-telling programs in arts and culture with ethnic and rural communities for nearly one decade. He has also been a consultant in transitional justice for several international donors in the implementation of the Colombian peace process and has extensively participated in promoting memorialization initiatives in the Latin America region. So before joining, before, sorry, joining the coalition as a staff member, he actively contributed to the Coalition Latin America and Caribbean Network and led the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth and Reconciliations program, supporting truth, justice and reconciliation in Colombia, which was focused on strengthening participatory processes with the Truth Commission and the unit for searching the disappeared. Um, so Dario is gonna come now and he will speak um, to us about the general context of the Colombia conflict plus the role of civil society um, in documenting human rights in Colombia. Dario, over to you now. Thanks so much, uh, Nana Jo. Um, I'm happy to address this uh, audience of um, Asian members and other uh, members across the world. It's a, this is a very exciting opportunity. We, I, I'm, unfortunately, we, we, didn't, we couldn't have uh, Jose Antequera to present the case of one of our 
member sites in Latin America and the Center for Memory, Peace and Reconciliation. However, uh, I would still, I would like uh, to provide some general context information about the documentation process in Colombia. As we have uh, in the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, we have a program in Colombia in the, in the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth and Reconciliation. And our program in Colombia is supporting the, the current peace process and uh, the implementation of the transitional justice uh, process. So um, I would like to share some um, thoughts and uh, reflections on the role of uh, civil society documentation in all this process in uh, documenting human rights throughout uh, 60 years of armed conflict and also uh, the role of uh, civil society documentation in the current transitional justice process in Colombia. So um, as a general overview of the Colombian context, uh, the armed conflict uh, started in the uh, uh, in 1948, and uh, then um, there have been several several failed attempts to finalize the conflict through uh, peace agreements. And um, then over the decades, um, civil society has uh, been um, organizing um, at a very patient pace and but very structured. Uh, uh, with a very structured uh, methodology because, well, it has been already 60 years of this process of documenting. And then by the 80s, uh, civil society uh, organizations developed very robust databases of human rights violations. And, um, but just to understand uh, what this means in the general context, um, I would like to mention that uh, the the attempts for peace processes in the past have been partially successful. In uh, the first attempt was in 1958 when the guerrillas were demobilized and uh, the, the the peace process was uh, apparently going to work. And uh, but there were paramilitaries supporting the conservative government of that time. Um, which um, took this opportunity to uh, try to uh, annihilate the uh, former combatants and the social basis of uh, the guerrilla movement. So what happened there was that uh, they initiated uh, again a cycle of massacres and the, the demobilized guerrilla uh, took arms again and they, um, they became... Uh, a very strong rural guerrilla. And uh, by that time, it, it was coincident with the Cuban revolution. So uh, there was a transformation of the contents of the general uh, contents or the general platform of the guerrilla into a Marxist movement. Uh, and uh, the guerrilla was then uh, split into several movements. So we ended up with uh, many guerrilla movements, uh, most of them, of uh, Marxist ideology uh, in the uh, 70s. And uh, there were uh, other failed attempts uh, to bring this conflict to an end. And, but then uh, in the 90s, in, in 1992, more, more precisely, there was a, a peace agreement with most of these uh, guerrilla groups. Uh, which um, which um, <clears throat> produced the um, uh, constitutional reform. The constitutional reform came as a result of that uh, of that agreement uh, uh, through um, um, uh, an assembly, a gen um, constitutional assembly, uh, which developed the current uh, the current. Uh, Colombian constitution, uh, including many ethnic groups in uh, and uh, also the uh, former combatants in the discussions of the terms of this constitution. So that process seemed to be very successful, but unfortunately it left, left out a couple of very significant guerrilla groups, uh, namely the FARC uh, guerrilla and the ELN. 
uh, which are still uh, well part of the equation of the current process. I will get to that in a minute. But then um, what happened there is that uh, the um, paramilitaries the, uh, were particularly um, supported by drug barons, um, produced uh, or developed very sophisticated armed groups uh, in principle to uh, combat the guerrilla movements, but also to they, they had a strategy of uh, of um, mass uh, killings and uh, and um, destruction against the and confinement against the populations in the areas where the guerrilla was uh, had their strongholds. So, what happened there is that uh, the rural communities ended up being victimized by the guerrilla, by the paramilitaries, by the army. And many other sites. Uh, well, there were the, uh, maybe a, a dozen armed groups, and uh, that situation escalated uh, through the 90s until um, finally. Well, that brings us to to the more recent uh, initiatives of uh, or or attempts to bring this conflict to an end. Um, with the negotiation with the with the FARC guerrilla, the great the, the largest one in Colombia, and uh, which uh, ended in the partial demobilization, and what the guerrilla did was uh, establish political uh, alliances with uh, with uh, opposition groups to um, to participate in the elections. In the local uh, the local elections of uh, mayors and governors, and, uh, and and the Senate and the House of Representatives, and they they were able to to get to many of these positions um, because they had a, a strong popular support. But then what happened there was that the paramilitaries organized uh, a systematic killing of the leaders of this of this movement of uh, congressmen and uh, presidential candidates and. So uh, they, they, the intention of the paramilitaries was to completely uh, annihilate this uh, opposition. And th so the, the FARC guerrilla went back to uh, taking the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the warring position. They, they took arms again and uh, the cycle started again. So um, from that time to the present, um, civil society has developed very sophisticated uh, methodologies and, and uh, work groups to collect documentation uh, and uh, to do it in a very systematic and structured way. Some of these uh, civil society uh, organizations were uh, started as litigating, uh, as litigating offices against uh, human rights uh, violations by by government officials or by um, paramilitaries and the guerrilla, and um, but then they they uh, finally collected uh, very relevant information as litigation organizations, uh, as lit litigating organizations, and uh, in, in a context where uh, we had over two million displaced people and. Uh, more than 80,000 disappeared persons. And for example, in, in, the, in the case of the disappeared as Fades, the Association of Families of the Disappeared uh, documented uh, thousands of these uh, disappearances with a very detailed um, documentation and procedure in preparation for international courts. Uh, also, Reiniciar um, collected information about the persecution against political leaders. Uh, and the CINEP, the center, uh, 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 an institution uh, based in, in research in a university, uh, developed a network of uh, human rights uh, databases across uh, the country. So there's um, uh, a lot of documentation that was collected in a very structured and orderly way, um, learning from uh, mistakes until they reached after many years, after several decades, this level of uh, of a very well articulated uh, 
base for basis for uh, for several purposes, not only for accountability, but also for memorization, for um, and for advocacy. And um, what happened there was that uh, the uh, well, civil society developed centers of memory where uh, the, these organizations would uh, disseminate uh, information and uh, convene uh, public meetings with uh, students and uh, with um, uh, groups, uh, well, stakeholders to, uh, to give visibility to the human rights violations through, uh, based on their on their documentation, and uh, these were the the main the most important model for uh, what later came as uh, government initiatives of centers of memory. The first of, of uh, which was um, the Center for Memory, Peace, and Reconciliation, which was the one that we wanted to introduce here. Uh, they are members of our coalition, and the other one was also. They are also members of our coalition. Was uh, the Medellin Center for uh, the Museum of Memory of Medellin, and then later on uh, the um, National Center for Memory was developed in uh, as, as a national initiative. But those are state institutions based on the experience of civil society documenting uh, human rights. And uh, the interesting thing here is that at, at first it was very difficult to put all these um, different civil society organizations to work jointly, to work together, because uh, some of them had uh, work uh, under the belief that uh, the other CSOs, the other civil society organizations, uh, justified their perpetrators. So they they f they felt that the, well, the victims of the guerrilla felt that the victims of the paramilitary were allied to their perpetrators, so they couldn't even be in the, in the same room. It's something uh, similar to, to uh, what you can find in Northern Ireland and other contexts for the different sites of the uh, conflict or, 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 or of the victims, not of the conflict, because the victims is a very different thing from uh, the sites of the conflict. Uh, the different, the different uh, collectives of the of the victims um, could not dialogue uh, between uh, with each other, but then there was an important process initiated by the Center for Memory of Bogota, which was the example that we wanted to bring, to uh, bring those uh, opposing uh, vi victims groups to uh, to the table to to have a direct dialogue, and uh, the the well the strategy behind behind that is get them to realize that they were after the same humanitarian principles. So um, this, I, I will just jump to the end of this uh, process. We uh, very recently, the government of Colombia reached an agreement with the, with the FARC guerrilla and they demobilized, that was the largest group. There are still uh, other um, guerrilla groups uh, in arms. So the process is once again incomplete, but then this time there is a, a very structured um, transitional justice um, uh, well, institution or as a, a number of institutions and mechanisms, the, the transitional justice mechanisms put in place by this peace agreement, uh, the Truth Commission, the uh, unit for searching for the disappeared and the special jurisdiction for peace. The special jurisdiction for peace being the only judicial mechanism in the three. The other two are non-judicial. But then uh, uh, we will jump very quickly. We will not go into detail because we don't have time right now, but then we will get back to that in the, in the training and other uh, moments uh, or in other circumstances in this, uh, in this uh, conference. And, um, but the main thing here is that uh, the Truth Commission was able to do, to develop their, their work or, or their research based on the documentation that civil society had collected. And the irony, the irony behind that is that sometimes the government uh, information, the information that should be uh, uh, found in the government institutions is not available for lack of political will sometimes, but many times because the archives have been destroyed over time. However, a civil society has been um, very carefully collecting the um, these uh, pieces of um, 
of archives, of official archives throughout the uh, litigation over decades. And then um, the Truth Commission has had access not only to the sources from civil society, but also uh, official sources through the archives uh, produced by civil society. And uh, so at this moment, many people, uh, well, many organizations across the country are developing their own um, their own documentation strategies to contribute to the Truth Commission. But the main message here and the most important thing is that uh, the only really, really relevant uh, or relevantly useful information for the Truth Commission and for the Special Jurisdiction for Peace is that uh, documentation that has been collected uh, and structured over the years. The, the groups of civil society, or civil society organizations and victims associations that started their work of collecting information, documentation in the recent, in the, in the last uh, two years of the mandate of the, in the recent two years of the mandate of the Truth Commission came in too late and uh, developing their expertise and their capacities to uh, structure the information uh, couldn't be deployed on time for the Truth Commission to be able to use that documentation. So the main message here is that uh, it is very important to uh, to keep very very well structured and robust records and archives uh, in civil society, even if uh, uh, if there is not a, there's no transitional justice process at site in the in the near future. So I think I, I took already my time. Um, I won't say much more than that. Um, and I will, let's just see what questions you may have about this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dario. And uh, my apologies for being strict on time. It's just, we're running a bit late. So we're about to start the uh, Q&A session. Um, I see that there is uh, a question that came in from uh, James, James Yan Chan. Um, it's for Fidel, actually. Um, and it's two questions regarding the human rights documentation on the ground. So the first one is, what were the most difficult challenges your team or those documenting faced during the documentation processes in affected region? Um, could you share some of the, those challenges of your work with us? So, uh, Fadel, can you just briefly, uh, respond to this question? And then there's another one. Um, please bear in mind that Sophia has to leave actually in the next 10 minutes. So, um, uh, grateful if you could, uh, be, a, be brief as well. Um, thank you and thanks for the question. I'll be like brief. The most challenging uh, uh, now uh, or difficulties is facing us is the frustration actually from the community and the uh, lack of co cooperation. We rely on um, on the victims and on the uh, families actually to share information without this and that actually uh, due to a lack of, um, or, or, or due to the vanish of um, accountability at all, uh, and the continuity of, of crimes uh, in, 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 in almost uh, 10 years without any, without total impunity. Um, um, so, so that, the, what is the benefit of the documentation? Um, the, we always faced of, uh, or, some, or sometimes now, uh, even um, uh, mainly the uh, previous couple of years, the people does not respond respond at all to um, question or, or follow up. Uh, comparing with the with the, uh, like beginning years, the people was uh, themselves was uh, from their enthusiasm um, moving to, toward us and 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 um, want to document that and want like. Uh, to hold the, the, the criminal accountable. Um, this is the, 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 the one, and also the um, intensive um, security services follow up uh, of each like speech of each comment is still the eye on hand uh, or fist uh, in, in Syria, mainly in the regime um, uh, controlled area. 
um, the, the regime is recontrolled um, those areas. So the fear is being back again, and that we need to take it in the consideration. Um, the, 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 uh, so um, uh, this is actually the, the, the second one. The third one actually is, is as I mentioned, the um, uh, Syria is under several control parties. So each 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 area ha has um, somehow different um, challenges uh, than the the other area. Um, sometimes um, uh, uh, we have more access of of one area rather than the other one. Regarding and that's very brief regarding uh, the second question. Um, there is no peace process at all, or even we still, uh, after all of those years, pre-negotiation um, uh, like stage in, in, in Syria till this moment. And all of those years was just wasting time. Um, there is no implementation at all of the UN Security Council resolution, mainly uh, the regime re refused actually any transformal toward a political, uh, uh, transformal political uh, um, uh, status toward um, like um, a, a, a democratic, respectful uh, uh, countries to the human rights. Um, uh, and the, the regime uh, uh, want to keep this family ruling Syria for uh, for almost more uh, um, uh, 50 years um, ahead. So why the regime without any pressure? Uh, I'm giving just a, a quick example that all of those crimes against humanity committed by the regime, killing above than 20 to 200,000 Syrian citizen, torture above than 14,000 Syrian citizen, those are amount of crimes against humanity display, displaced half of the population. There is no economic sanction from the UN against the Assad regime, even not a military sanction. So Russia can sell weapons to the regime, even China, any countries. The sanction imposed by democratic countries uh, um, to, to, to the regime, and even those sanctions are, are are not enough at all without a political will uh, to to end this um, disaster uh, conflict. So that's also a very brief uh, due to the request from the moderator. Thank you so much, Fidel. Um, James, I hope that um, answered your questions. Um, I see that you have one for Sophia. I actually also had one for Sophia, but I'll let you take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Sophia, um, the question from James is, well, James said he appreciates your presentation about the human rights documentation of violations that your organization documented during the Second World War. Based on the process of trial, what was the success of the court in prosecution of war, cri uh, war criminals or perpetrators? Um, and may I ask you just briefly as well to just tell us a bit more about the work that you you currently do, I think these that, that would actually tie these two together. <laughs> okay, I'll try to do that. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, I'll start with the one from James. Uh, thank you for the question. So what was the success of the IMT of the Nuremberg trials? Um, well, that's that's difficult. I think um, that the trial itself took place was a huge success, that we had this successful cooperation from the four allied powers together, that they worked towards this aim was a great thing. Then um, that the trial actually um, was just, well, it was almost a year and it ended with um, the verdicts. Um, and I think, well, we could talk a lot about if the verdicts were just or unjust, um, but nevertheless, we had a fair trial. And according to the rule of law, this was a more or less um, great outcome, I can say. So um, 
I hope that answers your question a little bit. I think um, that we had the verdicts and that the trial took place was the success of the trials. Plus, if you look at today, um, at the development of international criminal law, the fact that there was the ICTY, the ICTR, those tribunals I mentioned before in my presentation, and the ICC today, that was hugely influenced by the trials in Nuremberg. Without them, they wouldn't have um, happened like they are today. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, though, just to mention that that's not all. There are other developments in international criminal law today that we did not touch today in the discussion, um, but there is more to that than just those institutionalized courts. So I hope this um, answered your question. And to your question, uh, Nana jo, um, for the work of the memorium, well, of course, first of all, we try to inform and uh, to document the Nuremberg trials. What is very important to us for our visitors, um, we give them facts, but we do not give them one narrative, this is how the story went, but we want um, to encourage them to think for themselves, to think critically, and to come, for them, come to a conclusion for themselves about how things happened. Um, of course, we do organize also event discussions with different speakers to highlight various aspects of the trials like rule of law or democracy. Of course, we also do offer guided tours through the exhibition. Um, something that is very important for us in our work, um, we try very much not to just stick to the historic facts and stick to history, but to always connect these historic um, incidents to the present and also to the future. What can we learn from that? It's 75 years ago now. Um, what's the influence of the Nuremberg trials today? And I think it's more than just international criminal law today, but also some things, as I mentioned before, with regards to democracy, with regards to human rights or to the rule of law. So this is something that we always try to, um, to, to work on. Yeah. Um, I hope that has answered all your questions now. And um, I'm thank you very much again for the invitation for, for the opportunity here to talk. If you have any more questions, feel free to write me an email. But I'm very sorry I have to leave now because I have another meeting in a couple of minutes. And therefore, I will just take this opportunity and say goodbye to you all. And thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Sophia. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Um, and it was very informative what you shared with us today. Um, on this note, actually, we will be ending this session, but I've shared with you the email addresses of Fadel. If you have more questions, you can email him directly. Of Sophia, um, if Dario could share as well his email address in the, um, in the chat box, you can continue discussing in the chat box as well. And then I think now it's supposed to be a coffee break. Um, Sylvia, can you confirm? Yeah. Yes. So thank you the, to the three of you uh, for your contributions and uh, for participating here today. It was great to have you. Thank you, Dario, for stepping in and give us an overview of the process in Colombia. Um, we are running a little bit behind, uh, but just uh, a couple of things. Uh, now we will go into um, a break. Um, please uh, make sure they will show up a poll um, to assess and evaluate the session. This session, please make sure to fill it out. And then uh, we have a very special um, sort of like activity. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, today we were supposed to be in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh at the Liberation World Museum. Uh, we obviously cannot make it there make it, but um, that will not stop us from visiting the museum. So uh, following the poll, I will invite you to go walk through the uh, virtual doors of the Liberation World Museum and, and visit it. Um, and then once we are done with the uh, virtual visit of the Liberation World Museum, uh, we will get into the training, the, um, the training that our colleagues from the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth and Reconciliation will conduct. Uh, on the role of um, community-led documentation in transitional justice processes. So let's go into the break and we will resume at 4.20 uh, DACA time, 11.20 CE time, okay? 
So we will still have our 30 minutes break approximately. Thank you very much, everyone. Please make sure to, to fill out the poll. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, too. Thank you.